Welcome everyone to the inaugural episode of our podcast series Diversity Viewing Inclusive Conversations brought to you by the CII Center of Excellence for Leadership and Watson University. I am Madhulina Das and I'm thrilled to be your host for this insightful journey into the realms of diversity, equity, inclusion and belongingness. Talking about our center, the CII Suresh Nyotia Center of Excellence for Leadership is one of the 10 COAs set up for enhancing development and progress through a diverse range of services. Established in the year 2009, the center was initiated with the purpose of serving as a key facilitator of leadership development across various segments of business and socio-cultural demographics. The Watson University is the flag bearer of the first private universities in the young state of Telangana that is always bursting with energy and ideas. A pioneer in bringing new age programs in various fields, Watson creates robust platforms for learners to power through change and embrace disruptive technology. Whether in management, technology, design, architecture, liberal arts or law, school of sciences and much more. The theme of the podcast, while diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging are trending keywords these days and almost all organizations are talking about it, there is less real difference on the ground. Even if there are some statistics to show that there are organizational policies around DEI, but they are still too small to make a larger societal impact. The deep-rooted beliefs of exclusion practiced for generations are far too visible and easy to practice with long history behind it. And the comfort that many people have done things this way, hence, in the process, some divides that have been carried on for centuries just go on such as the gender divide, the urban-rural divide, the socio-economic layers, the LGBTQ rights, the caste divide, the cancel culture, tokenism and much more. And I just to name a few. With the first quarter of the 21st century almost behind us, we only need to question these but also correct them if we want to make any substantial improvements in this century. Through this podcast series, we are trying to bring the various stakeholders together to have a better understanding of the diversity that defines us as a society, the equity and inclusion mindset that everyone needs to practice to create inclusive environments where everyone feels valued and respected and contributes to a holistic growth. Now, let me take the opportunity to introduce our esteemed guest for today's episode titled Breaking Bias Strategies for Everyday Inclusion. Joining us are Dr. Kakuli Sen and Mr. Chandra Durai Swami who bring extensive expertise and insights to our discussions. Dr. Kakuli Sen is the CAS Sustained Dean of the School of Business and Hamid Bauchiki Professor of Managerial Innovation at Watson University. Her distinguished career marked by scholarly excellence and visionary leadership delineates innovation and academic rigor. With a PhD in management, eight years in corporate and 17 years in academia, Dr. Sen brings accelerating progress in academic leadership, institutional advancement and international collaborations. She has managed diverse education systems, taught globally and contributed to prestigious journals. As co-chair of the Center of Excellence, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Watson University and Professor and the Dean at the School of Business for rise in multiple fronts including organizational behavior, HR management and leadership training is noteworthy. Mr. Chandra Durai Swami has over 25 years of experience in marketing communications. He has humanized brands and leaders through inclusive storytelling and he has also leveraged his communication expertise to break the bias and build awareness around LGBT plus and PWD inclusions from offices, shop floors. GE and NHRDN recognized his efforts with Inclusion Awareness Award in 2021 and LGBTQ plus champion award in 2022. He has guided over 15 organizations on their inclusion journey and is a sought after speaker at HR events and inclusion conferences. Over to you, Dr. Seth. Thank you so 
so much madhulina for that wonderful introduction and setting the stage right for the very first episode of this podcast series and um, thank you so much mr chandra durai swami to uh, join in as the first guest of the series with the kind of work that you've done i think you are just the right person to set the stage right and start this conversation and today we are going to be talking about breaking bias strategies for everyday inclusion though i have put together a few questions i would like to start with uh, an observation that i have on this word breaking bias for the last uh, some time for the for the recent times i've seen bias just like mental health has crop started cropping up in different conversations people are talking about it organizations are talking about it uh, there are articles being published there are papers being published and so on i want to understand from you that what is this uh, word which has suddenly become a buzzword everybody is talking about it what do we really um, understand from the word bias if you could talk about it please thank you for inviting me to this podcast uh, dr kakoli sen and cii it's a great opportunity to share some of my experiences on this topic with our audience today a uh, great question i mean great converse a great question to tee off today's conversation what is bias and uh, what are some of the uh, uh, day to day examples of bias as well a strong feeling or a preconceived opinion that people have against a person or a group of people is what bias is all about for example i see a tall person walking into the room immediately there's something called uh, the bias that that creeps into my mind i probably think this person is very powerful i probably think the cognitive ability of this person is extremely high this person is very intelligent when i see similarly a short person walking into the room probably uh, i assume the person is timid the person is submissive the person uh, is subservient i don't see this person as a, a a leader so this is a bias that i have research shows that people are influenced by, by such biases and this has resulted in inequality we may not have facts we may not have data to show those attributes of a tall person or a short person but nevertheless the preconceived notions that i have of these two set of audience actually gives rise to bias and this bias gives rise to inequality research has shown that tall people end up making 130% more than shorter people so this is manifestation of a bias so you have a preconceived notion about somebody or a group of people and then you take that to drive your decisions and that propagates discrimination and sometimes can go further to fuel hate and um, harm as well okay all right thank you so much but i'm why you were speaking mr durai swami i was also wondering that there must be some uh, background some uh, reason or some uh, you know over time these biases get built when i see a tall person and i feel or a or a good looking person or uh, somebody uh, who for some reason i assume that they are also good at something else whereas i don't really see a connection because probably i'm meeting that person for the first time uh, but there must be some basis on which these these biases are formed would you like to tell us about something about that i'll point another example to you uh, to explain this particular uh, incident that happened uh a few years ago when i was traveling all the way from us to india uh i was coming back after a work assignment uh i stepped into the flight and i noticed the two pilots on the huge aircraft were women immediately i felt anxious because i have never seen women drive or women pilot such huge aircraft look at the weight of the aircraft look at the wingspan of the aircraft look at 300 plus people seated in the aircraft i've never had uh, two women pilots who were going to bring us uh, on a transatlantic journey i was fearful and every little turbulence that we encountered on the way 
i was constantly thinking are these people doing a, a good job are they not tired uh, how are they going to ensure that they don't fall asleep so all these questions because we've had some accidents happen but nothing with respect to women we've had some airline accidents that have happened um people falling at the wheel so on and so forth but nothing uh, with respect to women so i was little anxious but at the end of this trip i realized that i had a data point today and i said i need to throw this fear i need to throw this anxiety that women will not be able to pilot such huge aircrafts and get so many people on their shoulders um you know um and and get them to their uh, family safely so that is a bias that i had i corrected myself so every time i come up with a similar bias i always remind myself hey what did i think of a uh, women pilot on that particular journey from us to india and how did that uh, how did i correct my own bias and my own perception with data that's a great thing to do mr chandra uh, i was just working i was just wondering that um, did we somewhere connect uh, the uh, flying of the aircraft with the physical strength of the pilot because whether it's a man or the woman the 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 uh, in the in the in the cabin where they are flying the machinery doesn't know who's flying them as long as they they push the right buttons as long as they do the right things right assessments it doesn't really matter because there is no physical strength involved in it so i'm just wondering that you know you are a conscious person and you did the analysis and accordingly you you corrected yourself but when there are other situations when people make these assumptions and take decision because for you that decision was taken the pilot was going to fly the plane whether you are uh, scared you are happy you are relaxed did not really matter that decision was taken by somebody we were just part of that that decision but when when we had to suppose somebody is in the power to decide that whether a woman will fly the plane or not and um, then it could i think it could uh, you know cause a lot of damage there but my question was that uh how do we form that bias what what i was also thinking that as far as i understand these you know humans uh, our human brains are wired to to make sense of things all the thousands of things that are floating around us or information that is that we are continuously bombarded with we try to make sense of things and we try to put things into into some kind of uh, you know boundaries and from there uh, and also from our own experiences if we feel that or if we have seen that some people some tall people taking your previous example some tall people have been successful they have been confident they have been able to achieve something which is which is of worth and uh, so then our mind makes a connection that okay if there's a tall person if the successful person was tall probably all tall people will also be successful and likewise so we make these connections and that is how gradually those without even knowing we start making those uh, unconscious uh, you know decisions based on these unconscious biases so that's a great uh, example that you said what are the different kinds of biases do you think all of us carry of course you know all of us have biases but what are the different kinds of biases do you think that we have research says the more than 175 documented biases mm. I, i may not be able to share all of them but i will mm. share some of them yes please confirmation bias is something that uh, we all have listening to a piece of information and then we confirm our existing beliefs for example when i went to do my masters in the us in 97 before i left my father sat me down and he gave me some life advice mm. one of the things that he said to me was mm -hmm. be careful of african americans mm. i don't know why he said that mm -hmm. but then your father says that you're going to a, a a nation that you have never been you're young so you just absorb all of this i had it in the back of my mind every time i mean my university was there in the downtown 
Mm-hmm. So you can naturally see a lot of African Americans. I went to Chicago, so you can see a lot of uh, African Americans in South Side of Chicago. Every time I saw a black person, an African American, I felt unsafe. I was mm-hmm. constantly replaying that piece of information that my father had given me, that was amplifying, and I was trying to avoid them. I was trying to uh, not have eye contact with them. I mm-hmm. probably thought that they were going to harm me, so mm-hmm. I kept that distance with them. to confirm my bias what happened was i was also mugged i was taking all the cash that i brought in my hand and i was going to the bank in the downtown to deposit the money and start an account and i was mugged at that point by somebody from the african american community mm. and that stayed as a trauma in my life i ran away from them i went into the bank and i i deposited my cash but i was afraid to come out of the bank after that and i stayed in the bank for 2 hours and i tried to call one of my friends to come and take me back to the university it took me 4 years after that to actually break that bias and to say that this is just one off incident until i had an african american who was a part of my team in my business school 4 years later once i started to interact with them understand them i was able to break that bias similarly we have a lot of biases for example you are you are at a university i will tell you the biases that people uh, bring in when they recruit for example they recruit from a an ivy league or an iit iim kind of a school immediately they think oh this is a great school we need to pay these people much more than the others there's a discrimination that happens there they already take one attribute of a person saying that you come from a business school you come from iit you come from iim and they create a halo bias around them yes that yes. you are probably the best another example you go into a negotiation somebody voices their opinion in terms of a price or probably puts out their voice in terms of a price and then the conversation builds on from there so that is called anchoring bias they've already anchored a bias in the system and they're misleading the entire system whereas people get li- led by a particular characteristic which is only price and not beyond price in terms of quality or other attributes needed if somebody is in a job us- usually march april is an appraisal time for us in the work workspace there's something called the recency bias mm. most people leaders remember probably the last incident whether that is good or bad and they use that incident to appraise uh, uh, their uh, team member without realizing that they could have done so many more good things before mm. that they, that they may have forgotten and there's familiarity bias as well sometimes people from a particular industry probably go back to their same alumni or go back to their same hometown to recruit from the same colleges right so there is a familiarity bias they probably think people from a particular region are really good or people from a particular religion uh, a region sorry uh, uh, have uh, are bullies are very aggressive so those kind of biases are also there and we must be constantly aware of it every time you make a decision on somebody ask yourself this question is there a data behind this can mm-hmm. i prove this or is this just a bias or how can i disprove this particular uh, opinion that i hold of somebody or a group of people that's a very important thing uh, what i also believe uh, mr chandra is that all of us have these biases and uh, that's that there is a reason why they are called unconscious biases because we are not even aware of that there is the affinity bias or the familiarity bias or the beauty bias or the confirmation bias uh confirmation bias if everybody is saying so it must be so so and then there are halo error that you talked about the horns effect also just the opposite also happens <clears throat> but if you look at it there are reasons why these biases have you know come up and uh, like you said your uh, father when he was sending you he sent you with a word of caution among other things he cautioned you about a particular group of people chances are that if he probably he did not have any such experience somebody else had some experience somewhere and a number of frequently enough so that that bias 
the the mind made up a decision that okay this has happened so many times and that and happened by a similar you know group of people so then we put two and two together and we say okay so we with these people you need to be aware of these people not that mugging is uh, only happening because of a certain section of people it it is happening you know maybe for maybe with so many people so many other times by so many other people but because we west our mind has established based on some frequency that this is what we will we will con- we will uh, kind of infer out of this and then these biases get uh, formed so all of us have these biases however as long and, and and there is no way that we can say okay i don't have a bias everybody has these biases the point is that when these biases start impacting our judgments or our decisions then they may have a problem so what do you think about this that how is it why is it important to know what the biases are and how can they impact in organizations what role can they play a negative role uh, in organizational decision making that's a great question let me start with the research statistics that says 60% of people in the workplace complain that there is bias this could be the way they were recruited this could be the way they were treated it could be the way they were uh, appraised this could be the way they were promoted or not promoted so on so the entire employee value li- across the empl- employee value life cycle they have reported uh, more than 60% bias if you look at the pyramid of hate yeah bottom of the pyramid of hate is nothing but bias bias fuels prejudice 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 fuels discrimination discrimination fuels hate hate fuels violence this is a, a a magnificent pyramid if you lay it down bottom is just the bias the bias is one that actually propagates stereotypes using my father's example mm-hmm. he said african americans be careful so that was a stereotype that was being created that stereotype continues to if it continued to stay with me and as i grew up in my career every time i saw a candidate coming from a particular community or a race i would immediately say no i don't want to recruit them mm. i don't want to hire them i don't want them as a part of my team i don't want them to give a particular vote so that is going to create inequality that is going to create exclusion that is going to be against diversity diversity is also going to affect the culture of an organization i repeat again diversity affects the culture of an organization policies not equal culture it is people that equals culture of the organization right. people are the ones who build the culture of the organization bottom line and top line it impacts productivity it impacts innovation it impacts profitability it impacts talent attraction talent retention this is what it does and it ruins the organization so if you let bias if you fuel bias in the organization if you let it to grow into prejudice into discrimination eventually the organization is going to suffer true true so uh, you know not everyone like you will be able to analyze one's own thought process and behavior and perception and uh, come out with okay this is a wrong bias that i have and i need to you know work around it how do you think uh, people would be uh, would, would 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 be uh, or able to understand what their biases are you know first step is to understand to recognize what your bias is only then you can work on them so how do you think people uh, will be able to should they should be able to recognize um, and then work and overcome their own biases i am a generation that still i come from a generation that still opens up the newspaper every morning mm-hmm. um i am not one, i i do like to read digitally but at the same time i love a physical newspaper whenever i read a newspaper i just finished one i have a pencil with me and every time i see a bias i underline the bias the the bias in so many different ways i am a marketing communication guy so i can really see sometimes when organizations say the global organization the image that they use to represent a global organization is only white people 
Yeah. I'm like, why? Why can't we have multiracial people as a part? A lot of Indian advertisements as well, right? The moment you put a white person, the product sells. They're just capitalizing on the bias that we all have. And we need to be aware of it, that this is a bias. And I am not going to let this fuel uh, uh, my decision or influence my decision to make a purchase. The choice of words, for example, uh, I'll give you another example. It could be either a headline or it could be a byline in a newspaper. The impeached US president addressed the college students versus the former US president addressed the college students. Mm -hmm. The moment you word, use the word impeached, your brain is going to latch on to all the wrong things that the person may have done. Yeah. You're going to latch on to all the negative experiences. Whereas when you remove that particular word impeached, when you replace that with a former president, that becomes more neutral. Our newspapers, our news channels constantly fuel this bias. It could be age related bias. It could be gender related bias. They're in the name of reporting as is, sometimes we need to also understand, ask ourselves this question, am I fueling bias? Hmm. So I gave you an example of images that are being used. I gave you an example of how words that are being used to fuel uh, as well. Sometimes hair color, texture, hair texture, age, etc. are also used to fuel bias. For example, this particular, I don't want to name a particular uh, product. There's an FMCG product that is being used for uh, uh, making people look fairer. Hmm. So look at look at uh, what is being used and what is being fueled. There's a bias that is being uh, fueled that the black is anything which is brown. Anything that is not white is not beauty is what it is fueled. And you use my product and you show somebody who's in a darker shade, but then they suddenly look more confident when they apply this product. I mean, how true is that? You're just fueling more bias in the system. So we need to consciously ask ourselves, is there a data point? Am I being misled? Can I see what is below the iceberg? What is below the surface? Because we only see what is above the surface and we make a decision. There's a huge portion of it that is below the surface as well. So we need to go down and look at that and then make a decision for ourselves. Two days before, I think it was yesterday morning, uh, I saw a newspaper article again uh, talking about a 24 year old woman killing a man. The first thing that I, when I read the article, I'm like, really? Women are supposed to be more compassionate. They're supposed to be more empathetic. They're supposed to be less violent. How did this all happen? Because this, these are all again stereotypes sitting on your head, right? Every day when I look at the newspaper, I bust so many uh, stereotypes that I carry. I, and you constantly, they, those are like bubbles. They keep frothing up and they keep coming on the surface and you have to constantly uh, defroth. You need to remove them from your head. So, but the moment they could have written the byline much better. Youth kills somebody rather than trying to bring the women angle, portray that, you know, women can be violent. Why do you want to take gender as a weapon to fight against each other? They could have done that. I think they have their life. own reasons, but I think they have their own reasons. And that's a matter of another podcast altogether that, you know, whatever people are, uh, whatever that, that latching or the anchoring that you talked about, they are using that so that, uh, you know, there is more interest. If we just put it in the form of a news, nobody wants that news because news is available much before it can come on the TV or newspaper. The news is all over the Internet. So it comes to you much earlier and faster than the traditional method modes. But if it comes, if so, the traditional modes need to repackage the same information in a different way to catch attention. So, well, that is that is a topic of, you know, another discussion and uh, some other time, maybe. I want to move uh, forward in this and um, I want to understand why it is important for organizations to create an inclusive environment and what do you think organizations are doing? Are there some organizations which are doing better and some which are which are not quite there and there is a need to do it? So how do you think it is, it is becoming uh, an organizational um, activity? And why is it so important for the organizations to do it? Like I said uh, earlier, 
there's a lot for the organization to gain in terms of productivity in terms of profitability mm-hmm. in terms of innovation if they create an equitable fair workplace for everybody i'm going to throw a statistic at our uh, audience mm-hmm. um, research shows only 25% of the organizations in india have a dei policy 75% of them don't have a dei policy which means they can't you don't even have a policy let alone addressing inequalities you don't have a policy which means the entire system is tilted towards a particular set of individuals and those are the ones who can succeed surveys for example are a great employee surveys that uh, some organizations do year on year some of them do half yearly quarterly all of that is a great tool for organizations to understand their people their policies and their processes just because there's a policy we think it works for everybody absolutely not policy is just a guideline it is not for everybody because all of us come from different backgrounds our needs our life experiences are very different so you need to make sure it is just a guideline but you can go above and beyond which means from the feedback organizations can go back and say what is it that i can do to make sure our culture is a lot more inclusive it could be starting off an erg it could be breaking a particular bias by hiring people from a different set of community could not seen in the workplace could be so many next is for people to be able to speak up many a times you don't have helplines or hotlines where people can call in and report and there's a discrimination that is happening when you don't have a policy why will you have a hotline so a lot of discri- a lot of discrimination that happens on the ground goes under report there needs to be a hotline where people can speak up without fear of retaliation and they they should be an ombuds who can actually get in and understand what is happening and give a solution third is open and fair transparent uh, open fair and transparent communication from the leadership just as how we have bias people have bias against the leadership as well that that nobody talks about so let's try and break those biases as well that is one of my objective in terms of trying to humanize our leaders we always look at leaders as though you know they're the uh, commander in chief and we just need to obey but at the end of them at the end of the day they're still humans they can err and we need to show the human side of leaders as well microaggression is another topic that is seldom discussed about whatever we, the words that we say sometimes you may find it very uh, appreciating for example many years ago i followed my aunt who had come down from my graduation in the us she was driving from uh, new jersey to rhode island once my graduation got over what are you going to do here why don't you come and spend a few days with me i said okay i will follow you i drove my car and i was following her it took two and a half hours for me to reach her home many a times she would be way ahead of me and then i felt difficult to keep up with her i got off the car went into the house had a glass of water and i said oh my god you drive so well i didn't realize much later in life that the statement that i made today was not appreciation but it was microaggression and i taught myself not to speak this way to anybody when you have people from a certain not so privileged background when they do really well don't go tell them i feel so inspired looking at you you're doing so well there's certain other ways of saying it but not this way where it fuels microaggression i'll finish this particular answer with a quote from peter drucker he says culture eats strategy for breakfast Oh, absolutely absolutely true so um as we were talking about that these biases get built over years and then they start either by your own experience or by somebody else's experience or by reading or propagation in some way or the other and then they become very uh, hardcore stereotypes and which are difficult to break and uh, then that continues and starts coloring our uh, decision making 
and in that case uh, it starts excluding people like you said you started excluding people of certain group only because you had your own bias so all of us have these personal biases and they are okay to have and they will be there but it is very important to understand that uh, you know uh, these are our biases and we need to work around them going forward i was thinking uh, sudhirai swami would you know of some organizations which are uh, which could be taken as examples of doing very well in this uh, in this building the culture of uh, diversity and inclusion by breaking biases which is also the theme of this podcast and do you think place. some of them have more some some sectors or organizations have more of these biases uh, and and maybe there are others who are doing very good so maybe you could share some examples with us perfect um see bias like what you said bias is everywhere it's omnipresent omnipotent uh, it is not um present in one particular sector or industry it is just so prevalent across every i'll give you a few examples where there are some biases and how some organizations have broken those biases manufacturing is a male bastion it's extremely hard for women to go there and survive it's only men it's all about men it's all about being strong it's all about muscles all of that but then women can do equally well that's an example where there's bias in manufacturing that women uh, can't do a great job um next is uh, banking financial services it's got a very positive bias there it is the only sector that's been able to absorb people with disability if you look at bfsi in india tata group has been leading the pack and accenture and so on and so forth they've been able to absorb a lot of people with disability as a part of their organization which is a good kind of bias but that needs to go beyond bfsi banking financial services vertical and that should be across every vertical technology when you think of technology three things that come to our mind bangalore hyderabad look at the regional bias that we have as well right any place can be developed as a capital bangalore had an advantage because of its climate and bangalore is quickly losing out on the climate over the last 20 years and today bangalore is already there without water so that is a bias that people use because people felt that oh i worked in the silicon valley that the, the weather is pretty similar to bangalore so i will come here and stay and they've just made capitalize bangalore and hyderabad as technology and startup capitals they can continue to exist anywhere there's bias for a particular age group of people it's very hard for you to find 50 plus people in the it industry because they're high cost resource they always want to replace those high cost resource with somebody who can be trained and uh, who will be a low cost to the organization so there's so much of ageism that is there as well ageism pwd women example in manufacturing so i've shared a couple of examples you can't even find a trans person they mostly hidden lgbtq people are hidden in organizations they don't wish to share their identity because of the taboo and the bias so i've shared some of the examples of where biases are prevalent this is not the complete list this is just a representative list uh, that came up in my mind i will share now some success stories that have effective mm-hmm. and how organizations have tackled mm-hmm. first i'd like to call out lemon tree in the hospitality industry in the hospitality industry anybody who stays in the front desk mostly they try and have women they want somebody they want to capitalize on the beauty bias mm-hmm. they want to capitalize oh women are much better more hospitable they want to capitalize on all the biases that we all have and third who would want to see a pwd person a person with disability at the front desk lemon tree broke that particular bias and they said we're going to have people with disability on the front desk helping our guests a lot of people thought this would backfire on their brand mm. but it actually helped them build their brand to be more inclusive absolutely tata uh, motors ashok leyland ola kirloskar mm. all of them have set up an all women operated assembly line yes i'll i'll give you a name of a state in india 
Tamil Nadu. 43% of manufacturing in India work in Tamil Nadu. So Tamil Nadu has done really well compared to other states which considers manufacturing as a male bastion. They said we're going to set up all these units the Tata Motors that I talked about, the Ashok Leyland, the Ola, all of them have their bases in Tamil Nadu as well. Kochi Metro. One of the first organizations in India that decided we're going to hire trans people. They went ahead and hired 30 trans people. Hmm. They sensitized their employees. They sensitized their public saying that these are the people that you're going to be seeing on our Metro. Be kind, be respectful. They are our employees. So organization, these are some of the success stories that I could think about in terms of how organizations are breaking bias and making the entire society feel more included and welcomed. That's a wonderful, those are great names and those are big names also. While you were speaking about them, I was also wondering that perhaps, uh, you know, um, Every other organization, as you rightly said, that majority of the organizations do not even have a DEI policy, um, which is which is understandable because probably they are trying to still survive. They are trying to, you know, uh, make sure that the business is is still happening. And for them, DEI doesn't become a priority at all. And then from there, the, the bias comes and the stereotype follows that, oh, these are only the bigger companies can do it. The smaller companies cannot afford to do it. Though it doesn't take a lot to bring in diversity. You know, uh, it may make more business sense. It may it may create markets. It may create a better work environment. Doesn't take too much to, to have a diverse, uh, you know, environment at workplace. But the notion or the unconscious bias comes that we are a small organization. We are struggling with what needs to be done on a daily basis than you know afford the luxury of doing any kind of diversity equity inclusive practices so uh, and then that goes on my own my my probably last and final question uh, would be that you know you talked about these large organizations which are bringing people from you know diverse communities how do who i'm assuming that they are also helping their own own communities to come forward and become uh, you know economically independent how do you think as individuals people can overcome their biases be more inclusive in nature and uh, you know uh, fight that fight uh, you know uh, that 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 discrimination that very comes very naturally to all of us without even realizing probably we don't want to but somehow somewhere some way or the other by words or actions we become or we practice discrimination how do you think we could we could overcome that how can we have the allyship which will help us move towards that absolutely that's a great question to finish our conversation today uh, for this question i'm going to share a little experience uh, i've been discriminated every time when i went out looking for a home to rent. When I go tell the landlord I'm single, they don't want to rent out. This was prior COVID. I mean, I've had this experience many times, but this was particularly prior COVID. I went to a person's home. There was a toilet board outside. So I stepped in and I said, are you, is this place still available? Can I take a look at it? The first question that I was asked is, are you married? Are you single? So I said, I'm single. They did not want to let this place uh, uh, to a single person. Immediately, he said, I've had trouble with single men who've lived in this property before. Police have come in search of uh, them. And I've had to go through uh, some bad experiences. I'm not willing to let this uh, place uh, for single people. Immediately, I countered his experience by saying that I'm willing to give you references. You can call my earlier landlord. You can call my organization. I work at the executive level at another organization. I said, you can have a conversation with them before. You can do your background checks on me. Uh, the man wasn't convinced. But then when I looked up, I found, I'm not going to mention the religion, but then uh, when I looked up, I saw a particular God that he prays to. 
and the god is single so i immediately turned around and asked the question is that god that you praying to every day single or married i said if he's single has he caused you any trouble and i left the place he didn't i didn't rent the house he didn't uh, uh, want to engage with me any further but then i just wanted to prove a point i wanted to speak up and i wanted to say this is a bias that you have and i'm willing to equip you with data and information for you to feel safe to rent your property uh, to me so and many years ago i wrote a column in times of india the chennai edition called single in the city so i talked about all the discrimination that single people will have to go through for example in clubs they say there's no stag in free allowed in movie halls they say there's a couple seat and then when you go on vacation and stuff like that they say oh there's a companion fare that is available so bring a companion a bit actually single people end up paying more taxes than people who are paid up everywhere around the globe this happens so the entire uh, system itself is against single people and i called out many such instances one i would say is to be self aware ask yourself is this bias do i have data points to show people that this is bias or can i show myself that this is bias be willing to speak up don't hold back raise awareness in the society speak up for other people as well not just for you speak up for other people and that is where allyship happens every time i go back and i create awareness in the shop floor or in the uh, office floors on lgbtq awareness i break the myths i tell them this is not a western phenomena i said this naturally occurs we have always been a very inclusive and welcoming culture but somewhere we've been way led and we've just become so discriminatory that we need to come back and accept people as they are and give examples from our own uh, uh, history and from our own mythology saying that how inclusive we've been the storytelling the art the culture so you use all of that to convey the story and break people's biases and give them an opportunity to experience what it is it is not just sharing all these data points but also take them along with you and i used to tell people let's go meet couple of trans people let's find out let's learn about their life let them also learn about what happens in our workplace when we invite people when we go into their uh, personal space professional space we are able to break those biases absolutely thank you so much mr adurai uh, swami for sharing that i i strongly believe in what you said just uh, a while back that when you were not able to get the house because of your you know marital status you turned around and looked at the god and said well you are you are praising some you are worshiping somebody on a daily basis and uh, he is not caused you harm so why do you think uh, you know any why have you you know um uh inferred or for some uh, maybe he's had some experience but that doesn't mean that we have to see look at everybody with the same lens so but that is what what he has thought of and probably anybody who's coming they are not challenging the way you did so it was very important to raise your voice or voice your concerns that um, it's okay you don't have to give the house but don't hold it against you know people of of a certain uh, group and uh, because that's not true that's a bias which has unconsciously you know gone into it settled down and made it into a stereotype you are not the only person who will not give your house for rent to such people you will also tell your own friends relatives and other people and that that stereotype will become strong and cause uh, difficulty to other people so i i do i do take this uh, word that you know it is very important to speak up ally shape speaking up uh, recognizing that there is a bias that all of us have what kind of bias do we have why is it important to overcome that and how to overcome that these are the things that we need to focus and with that we come to the end of this first uh, podcast thank you so much uh, mr chandra durai swami it was absolute pleasure talking to you about the biases that all of us have and uh, let's hope we we are more we can become more and more conscious about these biases and uh, try and overcome so that um, 
this becomes we look forward to a bias free society in a long time i think but at least we make that effort towards that direction thank you thank you so much dr kakulisan thank you cis for this opportunity to be able to share some of my experiences and some examples uh, to help uh, our audiences understand uh, more about bias great thank you thank you once again have a wonderful day thank you